Welcome to Habits You Love, a thought-provoking podcast about self-love, self-healing, and spiritual evolution. I'm Kayla Fazio, the host, and I take you on the journey of my own trauma healing and share real, raw, and authentic life situations. My mission is to expand your mind to what you think is possible for you and provoke thoughts of looking at your own healing you may need and help you discover the power you have within you to start a self-healing journey, build healthy habits, and create a life you love. If you haven't already, click the follow button and leave a review. Also, check out my website, habitsyoulove.com, where you can find even more resources, healing practices, and support. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to another episode of Habits You Love. Today is going to be a very special episode. I have my sister, April, joining us today. Hi, sister. Hi, sister. You're probably going to not be able to recognize whose voice is whose a couple times. <laughs> we sound very similar. But today we are talking about some good stuff. So if you have heard my earlier episodes, I think episode one through nine of my podcast, I'm essentially calling it an audiobook, quote unquote, because it's kind of a start to finish of just my story and everything that I went through. I've been through childhood, middle school, high school, and then when all the the mental health stuff and issues started coming up with my parents and kind of just my bird's eye view, my perspective of everything. But I I wanted to sit down with another sibling of mine and go through her experience because although this was both of our parents and the same thing was happening, April might not have gone through the same experiences or felt the same feelings as I did. We kind of have never really talked about this. No, unfortunately, our family just doesn't talk. (laughs) Exactly. I think my listeners know that by now because I say that like every episode. So I'm glad like I feel like you really have have gotten better about opening up about all this and with your talking and sharing and healing and therapy and all that you've done. I want to walk through with you, April, your experience with our family. So when did you first notice major changes in the family that were clearly not what we had been through or used to or how our family was. Yeah. So at the beginning of 2014, everything changed and it never went back. Dad actually had foot surgery. And after the surgery, he tried really hard not to take his pain medications for reasons I can't even remember. But he eventually did because the pain was so bad. And it was around this moment that I believe everything changed, whether the medications messed with his brain or something else. But this is where I remember seeing a shift in my dad and then eventually our whole family. We used to come over all the time as siblings, but around this time after surgery, we didn't come over as much because we thought our dad was just recovering from a surgery. One day we get called over because our dad wants to talk to us. And he explains that he's been living with this like dark cloud over him and that one day he heard from God and that cloud just miraculously went away. For hours, we listened to this. I mean, hours only for him to go back to isolating himself from us the next week. Do you remember that? Yeah. So I thought it was going to be a temporary thing. I was like, dad had surgery. He's obviously healing, like can't do much. It was on his foot. So you can't really walk around and do stuff. But yeah. And then it just started getting bizarre from there. It's just insane how it feels like it's overnight, but kind of looking back at everything, it probably was not an overnight thing. This has been leading up to this and whether or not it was the medicine that did it. He was prescribed Percocet and he claimed he didn't take it. And then he claimed he did. And then when he took it, he said he was in a dark depression. Um, And then that lasted for about a week. And then all of this weird things started happening. So yeah, that was in January. But in March, I get a call from my mom's dad that I need to go to the house and see my dad. And I'm in college. Like I don't live at home anymore. So I'm like, what's going on? And I get there and my mom is standing outside my dad's office, just visibly shaking. And I'm just so confused. And she's crying and says she doesn't want us to see our dad like this. And that's why she hasn't like called us to let us come over. And so I go in his office and he's leaned back in his desk chair and he looks like he's in a trance. It was so 
so bizarre. But I asked him what was wrong and he just stares at me and doesn't say anything at all. Now we are fully aware that something is going on with my dad in his head. Let's go back a couple of months, actually like half a year. Let's talk about May 2013. There are suspicions that maybe something did happen to our dad that All of this stuff happening in 2014 could be a result of. So May 2013, our dad was actually caught in or involved in a tornado. He was chasing a tornado. We lived in Oklahoma. It's a thing. We have tornado season, obviously, and he would always love to chase tornadoes. I remember that as a kid. He would go out and he would chase the tornadoes with friends. And I specifically remember, and maybe you can share your experience, but there was a really big tornado and I didn't know dad had gone and chased it but I I do remember getting a phone call from him that night and he was just he just told me he was like he said something like he he sounded very scared and he called me just to like say he loved me and then um yeah I don't know he just sounded really scared was this like when he got back home yeah when he got back home from this tornado but he what happened was he called me and told me like just some I'm like I just want to say I love you I'm so proud of you just want to say good night and I was not living at the house. I was like, okay, love you too. And then a week later, I remember we were at the house and mom made him tell all of us what he did and that he chased their tornado and he got caught in the tornado. So, I mean, you can explain what happened in the tornado. Like what? I don't know the full details, but all I remember is when he was telling the story, I was just laughing. Because yeah, I'm like, at the time, we uh, didn't think it was a th- like, a big deal. I yeah, guess. that's like, okay, that's what you went out to do. You got stuck. Haha, <laughs> so glad you're alive. But like, our dad was so goofy. Yeah. You don't take him seriously. So yeah. when he's telling the story, he's being dead serious. And we're just laughing because that's just our dad. Like, that's just who he is. So, but then, yeah. So, but honestly, I think that event happened and I was like, dang, that's crazy. And we never thought anything of it. I mean, there's a chance that like the things that my dad was experiencing six months later in 2014 could have been affecting his brain like the chemical imbalances in his brain from the being in a tornado like holding on for his life underneath an underpass he was with two other men and they all went through the same experience but whatever happened to my dad i think it really freaked him out and so fast forward to january 2014 you know apparently my grandma granny thinks he was starting to act different and like talk about different things and he was talking about the end times like after the tornado before a surgery and then he had the surgery and then he was on percocet and then he got into this dark depression and then he claimed a dark cloud went over him so it's like what the heck is all this so whether or not we put two and two together, I don't think we'll ever fully know the real the real reason for this happening. But all we know is this was not normal behavior in our family. So how would you describe our family up until this point in just a few sentences? Like, how would you describe our family? I want to say we were a normal family, but we are actually kind of weird because, you know, we were a strong Christian family. We went to church every Sunday. Both of our parents were married and it's just not really heard of as often anymore. I thought we had a great life, in my opinion. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. Dad ran his own oil and gas business. And I mean, we weren't rich, but we were definitely well off and had everything that we needed and then some. And to my knowledge, nobody had experienced any childhood trauma or abuse. I just think that, you know, we had a very happy, healthy family. Yeah, I would say I would say the same thing. Um, everyone from the outside looking in would probably describe our family as like pretty much perfect, but little did they know <laughs> everything that was going on. And I think obviously time reveals all. And as we got older and as we started to see more things and as we really started to see our parents' relationship in a more mature light, I think it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And I think eventually shit was going to hit the fan, honestly. I think it was inevitable that it was. I think mom put on her own little mask and kind of played her role. And dad had his own masks and played his own role. And I've told dad, like I told him whenever I had a breakdown with him and I had to like confess all my feelings, I just said, you guys didn't raise us very well. I mean, you did, but you didn't at the same time. It's hard to explain. It's like you gave us everything you need. We needed. You gave us 
I mean, we just had everything. I don't know. We had a good house. We had a pool. We had some of the nicest clothes. We got to shop. We got to, you know, my dad paid for all of our first cars. Like every single first car we had, he paid for for us. I never remember it being a struggle, but I just remember there was no like depth to our family whatsoever. It was all just, I don't know. It was, I just felt like everything was like hiding from something, you know? Yeah. There was no depth. There yeah. Was always masks asking something yeah so I was actually diagnosed with depression when I was 18 and I thought I was just a big fat disappointment to mom because I just thought she was so perfect and when I got diagnosed with depression she cried and she blamed herself so it's like she just wanted everything to be perfect she hated if anything if anyone ever found out anything about our family she did not like it she just tried to keep this perfect image up of our family I think that was like her biggest downfall, honestly. Yeah. I think her identity was in being a wife and that is where she went wrong. Totally. Oh my gosh. I mean, a wife and a mother, honestly. Yeah. Because that was her identity. There was no Tony without kids. There was no Tony without David. And that's, that was the problem is all, all of this coincidentally at the same time started happening when we were all out of the house, when yeah. they were empty nesters. Yeah. So the combination of my dad going crazy, my mom losing her identity because she no longer had to do laundry and cook and drive us everywhere. She was like, who am I? And my husband, who I'm codependent on, is withering away. So it was just a combination of so much going on at the same time. So when would you say you were first aware of all of this being like a serious thing? Like, like, oh, crap, like, we actually need to start to take this seriously because it's it's getting really bad. Like, when would you say that first crossed your mind? I thought it was really serious when mom tried to run away, but that was in 2015. Like, um, well, maybe not even suicide. Like, I think for me, it was when dad went to the mental hospital. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, we just had a full-on intervention at the house for hours with all of our family and my friends that are close with our parents. We just had this full-on intervention with my dad. And it was – should have been on reality or show or something because it was it was just insane. And I don't even remember the conversations going on. But I don't know. I just remember dad sitting facing all of us and we're all, like, in a horseshoe and all just looking at him like, you, something has to change. You're making mom miserable. You clearly are not well. You're not sleeping. And what's so weird, though, is he acted super normal that day. He acted so normal that day. Yeah. Why um, was he a zombie for the two week, two or three weeks before? But that day it was like, I'm fine. But I couldn't tell you. But I can pinpoint a, just the most wildest thing that has happened up to this point. Okay, was, what, what's that? Well, first of all, when we admitted him to the mental hospital, it was a freaking nightmare. He refused to sign papers to let us talk to the doctors yeah, as a family. The, the HIPAA. He didn't sign yeah. the HIPAA agreement. Yeah. So we couldn't call him. We couldn't talk to the doctors to explain this is why he's like this. So he was just in the mental hospital and no one knew why. My mom tried to speak with somebody and eventually she did get him to sign the papers um, because she had mentioned the tornado to the doctor and they're like, oh, okay, this changes everything. So... While he was in the hospital, I turned 20. So I called the facility and I asked to talk to my dad because it's my birthday. So I was explaining that. And my dad refused to come to the phone and talk to me. That was just so traumatic. I've never had a birthday where I'm not with my dad and I can't even talk to my dad. And he doesn't even want to talk to me. So it really hurt. But... I have to move on with my day. It's my birthday and I wanted to go to the circus. So I go to the circus with a friend. All of a sudden I get a call from my brother Tyler and I answer and he, and I can't really hear it because I'm in the circus, but he's like, I have dad on the other line. I'm like, what? So I run out and go find a quiet place. And that's when I start to hear my dad and he sounds really panicked. I'm like, what? And he says something along the lines of this. April, I need you to listen very closely. The rapture is coming tonight and I won't be going with you. You need to prepare for the rapture tonight. It is coming. I got the same call. Like scared the bejesus <laughs> out of me. 
Did you think he would steer? Like, did you think it was actually happening? I, I literally did. Uh, how do you think dad would know that? I don't know. I was scared. And what makes me so mad uh, looking back at that, I didn't go home. Like, I thought the rapture was going to happen. I didn't go home to my family. I went home to my boyfriend. <laughs> Rude. Okay, so to just bring this all together, our dad was involved in a tornado, May 2013. Didn't really see the effects of this. We just thought it was a funny haha story. You almost died. Wow, let's move on. Six months later, he has an outpatient foot surgery where he is prescribed Percocet, where he claims to go into a deep, dark depression. And then he claims a dark cloud comes over him and just like overtakes his body, right? And then he claims to get out of it. And then he kind of just starts to go back into a depression. And so this is now March 30th. He is in a mental hospital calling everyone, telling them the rapture is coming. Clearly he's not well. So what was going on like like during this time? You were, how old were you? What were you doing? What was going on in your life at all this time that this was happening? Because we all were in different, like, you know, areas of our life. I was engaged. I was living with my fiance. I was, you know, I had a regular job. Like I was kind of just like going through the, through the motions. So what was going on with you? Yeah, I was in college at the time and I was actually living with my boyfriend at the time as well. And my parents didn't even know that I was living with him. So I kept that under wraps, but it was a very toxic relationship that I should never have been in. So I'm trying to talk to my boyfriend about this and he just doesn't understand what's going on and not very sympathetic to me. So did you feel like you were alone in that? Because he never really came over to the house. <laughs> I think he met mom once. Really? Um, when things started getting worse with my parents, I prioritized my parents over him. Thank God. Um, and I just slowly just fell out of love with him and I was so over him during all of this but I was in a lease with him so I was just really waiting for the lease to be over so I can get the heck out of that relationship (laughs) but I was stuck like stuck yeah I think I remember you just spending a lot of time at the house yeah I was it's pretty much you just went over there to sleep (laughs) in your your apartment I was only working part-time too. So I had the time. Like Mm -hmm. I know that all my siblings, you know, they had their life. Like everyone was in a relationship. Everyone was working full-time. I was not working full-time and I was trying to get away from my relationship. (laughs) So I had the time and I am so grateful that I did have the time to be able to understand what was going on and, you know, being in the middle of it so that someone can speak up for what happened right now. Yeah, exactly. But it kind of looking back, it's kind of you were trying to escape a horrible relationship and not having that safe space to go. You're just going to an even more horrible situation, seeing our parents go through all this, you know, so that couldn't have been easy. Um, I mean, that's just kind of who I am, though, is just the fixer. I wanted to fix everything and I want to save people. So I, that's just how I've always been. So I don't think it really affected me as much as, you know, someone who, I don't know. Yeah. So do you remember during all this, if, if you're looking back, do you remember what was going through your mind at this time when all of this was happening? Like, what were you thinking? Was it like real time thinking? Were you just disassociating yourself? Were you just going through the motions? Like what, if you have a sense of awareness of what was happening, what was it? I really don't remember what I thought in 2014. It wasn't until 2015 where I was very, very involved in my parents' life. We were just trying to survive in 2014. Like we thought this was just temporary Mm -hmm. and it was gonna be fixed but it just kind of kept going downhill i mean um, yeah 2014 was definitely a blur um like i even get the timelines and the events all mixed up because it's just how much of a blur it was and that obviously goes hand in hand with my bad memory because of trauma and my disassociation from wanting to feel any feelings but i just yeah i just remember 2014 like what I remember is obviously January 2014. I remember dad being in the mental hospital, but like, yeah, because even mom went to the mental yeah, hospital. And then, I don't remember that. It's so weird. I didn't see mom when she was in the mental hospital. So I'm like, where did that time go? So she wasn't there as long. Yeah. Like, it was just a, like week. a few days. Or yeah, yeah, a week or less. 
So. But she wanted to check herself in. So I was like, what is happening? Yeah. I mean, this is all going on. And then you're getting married in May. Mm-hmm. And wow. That was dramatic. <laughs> Um, yeah, your wedding is in a few weeks, and we get called to come over for yet another family meeting. Like, we just had so many family meetings oh about the God, same thing. so many. And this time, it was my dad informing us that our mom may not be attending the first wedding of her own child. Her anxiety was so bad, she didn't think she can get on a plane. But I don't think I was there for that meeting, because dad told me by himself outside. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much said you have to be there. I said, yeah. There's no way you're not walking me down the aisle. I mean, there's no way. <laughs> like, who, who am I going to walk down the aisle with? So that was like, that was really hard for me to hear my dad even say those words of like, not even putting, I mean, you have to be a really bad place to not even want to try to make it. You know what I mean? Or going, going as far as to telling your own daughter that you're not going to go to her wedding. So, they were just really bad at that time. Yeah, but we did eventually make arrangements. I flew with my dad and then my mom drove because we were in Oklahoma, but the wedding was in Destin. So my mom drove to Destin with her mom. So we got everyone there, but that was that was the worst trip for me. Like my mom's stress and anxiety was so bad. Her muscles in her face were practically paralyzed. She couldn't physically smile, could not smile. Yeah. I watched her cry over that in the mirror saying, I, I can't, I, I can't move my face. And it was just so sad to see. It was basically like she had Botox and couldn't move her face. And that's from anxiety. But I just remember crying during the whole ceremony. I, I couldn't believe we were here. And oh, I lost it during the father daughter dance thinking that that might not have even happened. Yeah, a week-long wedding in Destin, and they had a a beautiful house rented on the beach. But I avoided that house like the plague. (laughs) I, like, did not want to go over there. Yeah, I didn't do anything. I was there the whole time. I got left out of so many things because I put mom as a priority. I left the wedding earlier because I knew mom was uncomfortable with, like, the music. So I didn't get to stay for the reception. I just sat upstairs with her. I remember I would, you know, say, where is everyone? And everyone's shopping Mm -hmm. or playing volleyball. And I'm literally here taking care Mm -hmm. of my mom. And I'm glad that I did that. But it, it was very hurtful that. I was excluded from things, but it was important to be excluded because I needed to be with my mom. But so obviously a lot happened in what seems such a short period of time. I remember that after one year at all that from January 2014 to 15 in January, I was like, we have gone through this for a whole freaking year and nothing, you know, seemed to have changed, honestly. If anything, it just got worse. So the beginning of 2015, when things were still not great, I mean, I think maybe there was a little bit of some, a glimpse of hope at the end of the year. I mean, we spent Christmas together. Everyone was together. I mean, you were even there and you were married. So Yeah. yeah. So Christmas 2014, we spent together and that was, I remember we do have pictures like we all terrible pictures <laughs> we, terrible if you I look mean, at the pictures of us mom and dad oh, are just obviously they're not the same but ugh. we were taking pictures like yeah selfies and trying to be funny and stuff yeah so what happens next i mean i remember i you remember this more than i do again my memory is so bad so kind of describe what what happens next So beginning of February 2015, I get a text message as I'm coming out of a college course from my brother. He said that mom is missing. So I drive over and I'm like, what do you mean she's missing? Well, I guess when he came over, she was just leaving the house and she had a suitcase with her. So obviously he says, what's going on? And she said, I'm going to end it all. And that was it and left. And I am just so thankful that Coven even walked in the house when he did because we would have never known that. Like dad wouldn't have called us and said that. So the fact that he was there was a miracle. But you have a cop friend 
and we called her and told her what was going on. And somehow, I don't know if it was you or Coven were able to track her phone. Yeah, we ended up being able to track her phone just from, I don't even remember how, through AT&T and all that. And eventually we got to it and it pinged that she was at the airport. And so we were like, is she actually getting on a flight or is she, what is she doing? So I call my cop friend. I'm able to tell her where she was and she knew what my mom's car was and found her. Eventually mom somehow answered the phone and she was just crying and bawling. And I was on the phone with mom as my friend was walking up to her. So I could hear her say, why did you send her, you know, like Mm -hmm. mad that we called my friend and mad that she was essentially caught. Who knows what was going through her mind at the time, but. Well, the suitcase she had with her was empty. So the whole thing was just bizarre. Like an airport, why an airport? Do you think she just did that? to see what dad would do yeah yeah i think she was yeah. i think she was constantly testing dad seeing how much he cared like yeah that makes sense like is he gonna try to stop me is he gonna come after me is does he even care and he didn't do anything yeah i, I mean, think she could feel that she was losing him like over time over time she was losing him her identity was being taken away she had lost Her kids, they weren't in the house anymore, and now she was losing her husband. And I will never know the actual reason for all that. Like, there's so many things that it could be. Like, maybe dad didn't want to be married anymore, and this was his way of trying to get out of it. Or, you know, it's just so, so many questions. April's shaking her head up and down. So many questions. So that will maybe never be answered, you know? So, obviously, mom is in a bad state at this time. She's taking suitcases, going in the car, driving off, saying she's going to end it. A little bit of uh, attention, I think, for for attention for that. I mean, I mean, I don't know if it really was. I mean, she really would, did. But why would she have an empty suitcase? That I just don't know. I just know that she did fully want to die. Well, yeah. I mean, I agree at this point she didn't, but I don't know. I, I don't know why you pack an empty suitcase – and go somewhere and like and say those words like well she could have planned on going buying a gun putting the gun in the suitcase checking into a hotel and doing it so obviously she comes back this is the point in time when she comes to my house and i i don't remember if she stayed the night do you remember if she stayed the night yeah okay, because so- we booked her an allegiant flight out of tulsa and they only flew like thursdays and sundays okay so i think she flew on thursday but i can't remember what day this was but yeah, she she stayed at your house. We drove her to Tulsa. It was the saddest thing watching her walk away. Mm-hmm. I mean, she just looked so scared yeah. and alone. Yeah. I'll never, I'll never forget having to do that. But she needed to be there. Yeah, I mean that is crazy. Like at least it wasn't a connect or you know having a connecting flight. Because man, I just can't even imagine going on a flight by yourself when you're in that state. So we send her to Florida to be with her parents at this point. Because at this point, we had no idea how to deal with her. We had no idea how to deal with her. And her parents being here was not helpful because my dad was there. So yeah, our gran- her mom and dad's, our grandparents spent, I think, what, six months at their house? That didn't work at all, obviously. So we were like, okay, how about you go there and try to be away from dad and not see him in the state he's in, and then maybe this will work too. But we were just like at our wits end. We were trying everything. Clearly three trips to a mental hospital, her parents being here in the house. Now we just had to send her somewhere else. She was there for a little over two months. Got there February and then came back uh, middle of April. Tyler and I, our brother, actually visited her over spring break. But then for my birthday, which is always two weeks after spring break, me, Coven, Dad, we all flew out to Florida to visit Mom. And then you came out too Uh and met us later for my 21st birthday. And I remember Mom was so happy to see everyone there because I was there just a few weeks ago. But there was definitely tension and awkwardness with Mom and Dad. I don't know if you 
remember or saw that? I mean, they were just being not talking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They weren't being their usual selves to each other. Yeah, it was just, you know, we were there as a family and whatever, and we did family stuff. But, yeah, definitely not the same. Yeah, one night they did go on a date, though, while the rest of us went to dinner. Mm -hmm. And I remember this so clearly because this is when Granny told us that Mom had tried to plan to take her life before. I don't know if you remember this, but there was always an excuse not to. She definitely wanted to use a gun, but she wanted to do it in January. But January is your birthday, so she didn't want to upset you around your birthday but then she wanted to do it in february but then that's her birthday and she didn't want us to be reminded of on her birthday then it was my birthday and then another excuse was i was in school so so she didn't want to upset me while i was in school so clearly she has been thinking about this it just baffles me considering she ended up doing it on father's day the irony of and the spitefulness yeah, that she ended up doing it on June 21st on a Sunday on Father's Day. I mean, there has to be a reason behind that for sure. Yeah. But anyway, me and Coven stayed longer than everyone else, actually. So I got to spend quality time with my mom there. Coven was actually staying with a friend in Florida. Uh, but she really, in my opinion, wasn't any better. She cried a lot. She wouldn't get out of bed. She said she just wanted to go home. But I told her, I looked her in the eye and I said, I'm not bearing my mom six feet under. You have to stay here. And one day I even went to a therapy session with her. And I hope this therapist is no longer in practice because what she said to my mom was so damaging. She told my mom, who was clearly suicidal, to fake it till you make it. And that is just so disgusting to say to somebody who doesn't want to be alive anymore. Like, fake it till you make it. I hope she's no longer practicing. So in April, I get a phone call from my mom and she said she's coming home. And my heart dropped because I knew she wasn't better. I just saw her a few weeks ago and my dad certainly wasn't better. So she should not be coming back to that environment. But despite my hesitation, she came back to the same dark environment we tried to get her out of. But she did attend some family events like we had a family friend get married so she went to the wedding and the shower and things seemed to be going okay but then a bombshell gets dropped so our mom's brother comes into town and my dad goes and checks himself into a hotel and we don't find this out until we get a text message from him my dad sent the most heart-wrenching text to my mom. And not only did he send it to her, but the whole family, including my grandparents. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Wait, don't you still have the text? Yeah. Should we read it? Yeah. All right, so this is a text message that our dad sent out to everyone, obviously on purpose. Again, this is just how my dad kind of operates. Like, he's very spiteful. He can be very childish sometimes. So he doesn't even want to be around my uncle, obviously. So he just decides to check himself into a hotel, which he's never done ever before. And then he sends out this text. So what does it say? Tony, the reason I had you leave my truck is because I packed a few things and I'm staying in a hotel. Nothing different. I'm just not upstairs. I know the timing sucks with Chris being here, but the time had come where I just couldn't stare at those walls anymore. Every day, the hopeless and despair gets greater and greater. There's nothing, and I mean nothing, that gives me the least thing to look forward to. I look back when all the crap began and can't believe you stuck with me all this time. That's just because of who you are, the most thoughtful and caring wife a man could have. April, remember the times I told you never grow up and be like your mom when she would get upset, probably be about something I did? Please forgive me because there's no one I'd rather you be like 
than your mom. Kids, I want you to know, no matter how you feel about me as a dad, your mom didn't deserve the way a husband ought to treat his wife. You see, with all this time I've had to reflect on our marriage, I'm totally ashamed of how much I fell short of being a caring husband. Brent, my advice to you is to treat Kayla with all the care and respect you have, and Kayla be submissive just as your mom has always been over these years. Tyler, COVID in April, the same goes for you, and expect nothing but the best. I, to this day, don't know why your mom and I got married, but to have four beautiful children. I truly believe when mom ran back up the stairs back in 83, she heard a yes, but I believe the yes was not marry me. I may be wrong, but doubt it. Tony, unfortunately, I still have a business to run, so I'll have to come home and take care of things. April or Coven, can mom use your car since Chris has hers? David. Gosh, that is crazy. So I haven't seen or read that message since that day. So to me, what that sounds like is like he regrets everything. It's like he regrets his whole marriage and... But to me, it kind of seems like he's been trying to push her out this long and he's like, okay, nothing's working. So here, I'm just going to lay it out. Like, yeah, because I don't know why I married you. (laughs) Because they couldn't communicate. That's why, like at the beginning, I said it was inevitable. This is going to happen because you have to like, you can't let 20 years go by and then be like, okay, we need to go back and talk about why we got married. Like you need to keep up with the time of where you're at and talk things out in real time and then move on. So clearly, obviously they have four amazing kids out of it, but they should have maybe never gotten that far. (laughs) So like, I think you're right. I think dad was just like, I think he wanted out probably way longer. And he was like, nothing's working. Like maybe dare I say it, but it's like, was that all an act? Was it all an act? It's just, was, just to be clear, we love our dad. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we do. But it's, this is reality. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so there's that text <laughs> message. So now I'm really worried about my mom. And I try to be at the house as much as possible. Oh, yeah, I remember that devastating her. Yeah. Like, yeah. she was not happy about that. And again, like, mom wasn't a strong enough woman in her own self where she could look at that and be like, fuck him, you know, like she, it did, it did the complete opposite to her. It was like, he, if I can't have him, I'm literally no one. You know what I mean? So speaking of, you know, if she can't have him, then she doesn't really want to be alive. It got so extreme that mom wanted to do a homicide suicide. She literally threatened to get a gun, go out in the woods, shoot dad first, and then herself. Well, she didn't really threaten it. She asked dad to do that. Like, she was like, can we go do this? Like, and that, again, yeah, that kind of just proves, like, she... It's like she didn't want him to live either because maybe she was like... I don't want you to be with anyone else. Like what? You just want to leave me. Maybe she was insecure in her own self that like she could sense that he wanted to not be with her and didn't want that. But yeah, I mean, that's what dad told us whether or not that's true. That's kind of up in the air, but apparently that was said by our mom that she wanted to shoot our dad first and then shoot herself, which can't even imagine that happening, but one's, one's good enough. Um, Mm -hmm. All right, so a lot has happened in what seems like a very short period of time. It feels like all of this stuff that happened could have been spread out into three years, but it was just a little over a year. And I mean, I wish we could say that there was a happy ending to it, but I think all of us kind of know what happened. So like leading up to that week, I, I personally don't remember hardly anything, but what do you remember about that week? Well, mom had this really close friend and I would dog sit for her sometimes. So about not even two weeks after we get that text message, I had already agreed to dog sit for a week. And so I'm there. I'm about now 40 minutes away from my mom instead of the five to 10 minute drive from my apartment. But, you know, this is my mom's friend. So my mom did end up coming over 
one day while I was there because she has a pool and we're sitting outside by the pool and I guess dad had asked her to go to dinner and a movie that night. And I just remember she was really anxious about it and she told me she was scared to go because she was scared of him. I don't I don't know why, but that's so weird. Yeah. And this is all like within a week of it happening. They yeah. go on a date and she says she was scared of him. Yeah. That's so weird. Uh, but I told her she didn't have to go, but she did anyways. Um, in the middle of their dinner, she started texting me saying how awful it was and that they weren't even talking. And I just felt so bad for her. That's so weird. So that was in the middle of the week. And then towards the end of that week, I get a text asking if I can stay one more day to babysit the dogs. And I agreed. And that is something I will regret for the rest of my life because my mom goes missing again. Her phone is off this time, so we can't track her. And my dad had told us that they had a discussion about possibly divorce and that really upset her. So we call the police, but there's nothing that they can do because she's an adult and left willingly. So there really wasn't anything that we can do. Like we just couldn't do anything. So I was defeated, but I agreed to go to lunch with my lifelong friend of mine, whose dad is actually my dad's best friend. So, you know, I'm telling her what's going on. And just in the middle of lunch, my friend goes, that's crazy that your mom tried to buy a gun. And this is the first time I'm hearing about this. But apparently my dad had told her dad that my mom was trying to buy a gun. So after lunch, I go ask my dad, did mom buy a gun? And he straight up tells me that she didn't try and buy a gun. So I reminded him what he told his friend, my friend's dad. And that's when he admits that she did go get a background check from a gun, for a gun, but that is all. But it's getting late and I have to go let the dogs out. So I have to go home. But I'm not very happy. So So mom's still missing. Apparently she goes and gets a background check. She's still not home and you have to leave the house. So the only person that would be at the house at this point is dad if she came home. Yep. Horrible. So I send out a group text to the siblings. And unfortunately, I added dad to it that uh, we are going to have an intervention the next day with mom. The next day was Father's Day, and we all planned we we're going to go to church, and then we're going to come back to the house, and we're going to talk about next steps. So later that night, I get a text from my mom, and she's telling me that she was just out getting her hair done, and her phone died. That's why we couldn't get a hold of her. I was mad, but relieved to know that she was okay, so I told her I loved her and went to bed. That would be the last text message I ever sent my mom. I'm glad it was I love you, though. So you had sent a text to everyone saying we had an intervention. Wasn't it kind of a discussion that you think that mom might have seen the text message on dad's phone? Yes. We believe that she saw the text on my dad's phone. So the next morning is Father's Day, June 21st, 2015. And she knows something's going on. Like, I assume she just doesn't want to be addressed anymore. Honestly, I think she was over at this point. I think she had kind of made her plans, got everything in order, had a background check. Don't really know exactly about the gun situation at this point, but the next day on June 21st, what happened? Well, it's Father's Day and you and I actually went to church together. And yeah, we go to the house right after church and mom's car is gone. So we get inside and we ask our dad, where's mom? Because clearly she's not there. And he told us that while he was asleep, she must have left. But then later he changes the story to I was in the shower when she left. So who, mm-hmm. who knows what actually happened that morning? Luckily, our dad had cameras installed outside of the house. So we were able to check and see what time she left. And sure enough. Um, It was within an hour of us getting there that she left. Not only did she leave, but she snuck out through the backyard gate 
instead of going through the garage. She also left her phone on the dining room table. So there's no way of getting a hold of her. She she knew what she was doing. And, you know, after a few hours, I decided that I was going to go look up the credit card transactions, but nothing showed up. We didn't know what to do. Like, I hate to say it, but it just felt like mom was crying wolf. So later on that night, it's me, my brother Coven, and my dad's close friend. We're all at the house talking. Um, And then suddenly I remember that credit cards have pending transactions immediately after a purchase. Sure enough, I get back on the bank account and find a pending charge for a hotel in Oklahoma City. And to me, it was like a gotcha moment. Like, gotcha, mom. Like, I've caught you. I know where yeah, you're you at. you even said that in a text message. You texted me the picture and said, gotcha. I did. Yeah. I called the hotel to ask what room she was staying at. But of course, they couldn't tell me. Well, my dad's friend was not having it. He called them back and demanded they tell us what room she's at because of the situation. You kind of explained what was going on. We got the room number. So me and Coven head out. And actually earlier, I had texted mom's friends from her phone to ask maybe she went over to their house, asked if they'd seen her. And they all said no. So as we're on the way to the hotel, I text, I remember texting all of her friends saying, we found her, we're going to get her right now. And I also, you know, texted y'all. Okay, we found her. We're going to get her. Little did I know. So it's dark by the time we get to the hotel. But we see my mom's Nissan Murano, which means that she is there. So we walk into the hotel, take the elevator up to the fourth floor. We make a left, and her room was on the very end of the hall. We knock on the door. We tell her we know she's in there, and we're not leaving without her. Nothing. Silence. So I leave my brother there while I go get the manager, who will hopefully open the door for us. I explain my mom is suicidal and we have to get in there. She tells me that she can knock on the door, but she can't open the door. But she does come up with me, knocks on the door, announces she's a manager, and waits two seconds and leaves. We keep knocking, begging her to come out. Then we have to threaten to call the police if she doesn't come out. All of a sudden, I can hear my mom get out of bed I can hear her footsteps coming closer to the door. Then I hear the lock unlatch and the door chain at the top jingling. I look at my brother relieved, thinking that she's opening the door. But she wasn't opening the door. She was locking it. That's next time on Habits You Love.